Quebec. I'm uh, on the Cloud Foundry engineering team. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about uh, Cloud Foundry, just very briefly, uh, about a project Bosch that we open sourced uh, last week for uh, automation deployment of uh, Cloud Foundry service. And uh, also a little bit about the CPI and how we can actually integrate with OpenStack and actually uh, provide a similar support that we have for AWS and uh, vSphere today. So, uh, it's going to go quite fast, I have a lot of slides and you fit into a small time, so bear with me. So uh, for the agenda, we just, again, talk about the background of the, the project, uh, both Cloud Foundry, the service, and also Bosch that we released last week. Then there's a lot of C's down there, so we'll talk about the, the concepts, um, some of the contracts that we rely on to provide the, um, the abstractions that we have today. We have uh, the control that we, um, provide throughout the system, and it's one of our main uh, design goals to have very reliable and predictable deployments for a large production service uh, that we do today. Um, then, again, uh, some of the other design goals with consistency. So when we're doing deployments, we need to make sure that uh, not only can I deploy from my own laptop, but uh, a large uh, engineering team can actually deploy from, uh, from wherever they're uh, doing the, the work from. So, and then finally, we're going to the actual components that make up Bosch and um, the cloud provider interface and how uh, we can extend, extend um, and implement the OpenStack implementation of uh, the cloud provider. So uh, I'm not sure how many of you have heard of Cloud Foundry before, but I'll just give a quick uh, background. So uh, Cloud Foundry is an uh, open platform as a service. It was uh, released last April, so a year ago. We just had our one year anniversary uh, last week. It is uh, open source. It is um, also open in terms of the frameworks of runtimes that it supports, and like I said, it can run pretty much anywhere. It runs as a service, uh, mostly by VMware, but it's also run by uh, various partners out there as well. So uh, that's a little about Cloud Foundry, and we can talk about a little more if uh, you have any questions towards the end of the talk. Uh, and then, so when we designed Cloud Foundry, we also realized that we needed a system for actually deploying uh, the service itself. So uh, the system today composed of uh, hundreds of VMs, and uh, we really were looking for a way to manage them in a um, very predictable, reliable way, and also uh, try not to do any manual steps and just use a single tool. And we looked at the kind of the ecosystem at the time, and we saw the you know trying to use Puppet, trying to use Chef, trying to use some of the other similar tools, looked at Capuchon a little bit, we liked a lot of things from the various tools, but. Um, we really were looking for just one holistic approach using one simple tool, something that all of our engineers could use uh, in a way to deploy very simple environments, but also very large uh, environments that we use in production. And we'll talk about uh, some of those uh, concepts and, again, design principles uh, throughout the talk. So if we actually take a look at what Bosch does or some of the, you know, the main features, is <coughs> it's one of the few tools that has a very prescriptive way of building releases. So if you take a look at uh, some of the other tools, they rely on the existing package managers, the existing ways of archiving the code, and so on. What we did was something different. We actually invented our own uh, packaging uh, system. Uh, it's not really an alternative to know, RPM or dev or, I mean, it's nothing along those lines. It's basically a way for us to go and create builds of code and basically go and release it out there uh, into the system so it can be deployed on many different teams. Um, next to the release engineering, we also have uh, we've been describing a way how to actually run these processes. So this is actually where it comes a little closer down to um, configuration management. But we spent kind of a little, very little time there, and we hope to integrate with some of the other uh, existing solutions. Next, uh, for lifecycle management, so we wanted to have a tool that basically performs all sorts of updates. We don't want to have a tool that only does small patches or full uh, rolling updates, and then a different tool for kernel updates. We really wanted to have a tool that no matter what kind of update, it's a single, you know, Bosch deploy or Bosch update. And that was really important and our developers don't really care what kind of change they're making, whether it's a one-line change or it's changing the Linux kernel from, you know, 2.6, 3.2, 3.2, whatever the next release is. So it was very important to have uh, a single way of actually managing these releases. Uh, I kind of been talking about this, but again, having a single tool and have it easy to use is very critical to us. So for uh, our engineering team, uh, we have many people uh, deploying uh, Cloud Foundry to their own release, uh, to their own uh, dev environment uh, many times a day. Uh, we ourselves actually deploy the production service twice a week. So when we do these kind of uh, rapid changes, at least rapid for us, uh, we really need to make sure that everyone on the team is empowered to actually be able to do a production-like deployment on their own 
And then when we actually do the production deployment to the real system, it's no different than what the developer did on their own little uh, environment. Um, and then finally, the infrastructure portability was really key. Even for us at VMware, I mean, we have uh, vSphere, we also have the vCloud um, director, and they have different APIs. And from the very beginning, we realized we didn't really want to build uh, or have a really tight coupling between our system and the actual infrastructure below. So we created a very simple, uh, it's literally 10 methods of how we actually interact with the infrastructure service. Um, and we implemented one for vSphere, uh, there's one for vCloud coming later this year, and there's a work in progress, in a, kind of a full-blown implementation for Amazon as well. And uh, actually, Dr. Nick, I don't know if some of you guys might know him uh, from the community, but he actually uh, deployed uh, the WordPress sample that I'm going to talk a little bit about to AWS uh, earlier this week, so that was going to be exciting. Um, so next, I'm going to kind of uh, quickly introduce the concepts, uh, and then dive into them a little deeper in the future slides, but um, so like I said, Bosch is a source, I mean, a release engineering tool, so we manage uh, all of the software that goes into the system. So let's say you're deploying, I don't know, some kind of a Hadoop cluster, so all of the Hadoop components are going to be in the release itself. Um, we'll see the WordPress release, we have uh, the MySQL server in there, we have the WordPress processes and whatever else in there, everything has to be in this release. Um, we have packages and jobs, packages kind of again, describe the, just the software uh, bits, uh, jobs describe how those bits are actually run inside the VMs and how they're actually managed through the updates and how they're actually updated in a way that doesn't have a strong uh, impact or a high disruption on the system. We have a service that we don't want to have the users feel the updates twice a week. So we have a lot of hooks to drain the sessions um, and just make sure that the, the updates are very non-impactful or as much as we can. Uh, releases kind of tie in some of those things together. Uh, stem cells is our term for uh, VM templates. So we have also our own VM that we deploy, which is kind of important for us. Uh, it has a little one of our components that makes all the things above uh, happen. And then finally, deployments is what actually kind of ties all of the uh, things above together. So everything will be uh, above deployments is completely agnostic from where it gets deployed. Whether you deploy this on AWS or you deploy this on your own private vSphere cloud or OpenStack, um, it doesn't really matter. All those things are going to be the same. So when you build a release for you know, WordPress as one of the samples or Cloud Foundry, that same release is going to be deployed on all those uh, same things. Uh, the last part actually kind of like binds the developer to the web. It has the very explicit networking settings, storage settings, um, and basically everything that has uh, a template, it gets uh, bound at that point in time. So that's kind of important. So now we're uh, looking at the source and blob. So this is kind of a, a little LS tree out of our uh, release repository. Uh, it's maybe a little hard to see from the back. but. Uh, the important thing is, again, when I said prescribe, we really have a, a convention of how we do a lot of things, but this convention gives us a lot of flexibility and a lot of power of doing almost any kind of update. So here we have the, just the top level structure of the release. It's basically a Git repository, so we chose basically one of the source control systems and we use Git. Um, all of the code is either sub-module of this or directly in here. If it's a large binary object, let's say the MySQL or uh, I don't know, the Redis, uh, source, we probably don't want to check that into Git itself just for um, polluting the index. So we create a little uh, helper to use uh, blob um, API using the Bosch CLI. So we have a simple tool called the Bosch CLI. And it helps you kind of manage them and store them in a, in a um, abstracted out uh, blob store. So you can use S3, you can use um, anything else that implements a very simple uh, run API. And that's important so again, we don't want to have gigabytes of data in our, in our Git repos. So next we have packages. Uh, like I said, packages are, I mean, it sounds like you know package manager, but it really is not. Um, it is basically just describing what actual files make up the contents of a terminal. I mean, it has very limited metadata, but again, it's very, very uh, simple. Uh, it has dependencies, but dependencies are not the runtime dependencies. These are dependencies for actually preparing the package. So uh, an example in the, on the Ruby side, so if we have a Ruby component, we actually need Ruby itself to do some kind of bundling or installing of the system. So again, these are basically dependencies for getting the package packaged or compiled. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit further down. Uh, for versioning, again, um, if you take a look at our system, we have a lot of versions in place. But every single one of these versions are not semantic. They're more like build numbers. It's important because they're fully managed by the Bosch CLI. And it makes it very nice that you can actually track what happens between one release to another. So you can actually, you do a Bosch create release, you build some packages for you, you see the new versions. You make a change and you see that the version gets bumped. So it really is a build number, but it's very, very important to uh, to uh, to see what happens in production or you know, uh, 
development environment and how you progress through the changes. Uh, finally, there's two things, pre-packaging and packaging. So um, these packages are kind of agnostic from, again, from where they run. So whether you run on a 32-bit system or a 64-bit system, or like I do a lot of my development on my Mac, and you know, we deploy on a, an Ubuntu farm, um, it's important for us to basically you know, have that flexibility. So what we do is instead of actually providing the binaries up front for most of the things, we actually just provide the source. And then when we actually deploy the system, the very first step is it tries to actually go and compile or prepare the package to be used in that environment. And it actually uses exactly the same VM template to prepare that package as the one that's actually going to be using later on to run it. So you're not surprised with you know, compiling something on one machine and later on moving it somewhere else where it's not going to work. You're going to know ahead of time that it's, it's uh, not going to work when you compile these things. And then finally, uh, pre-packaging. Um, basically, we have a little hook. If you need to do any kind of uh, third-party fetching of, of, of components or whatnot, you can actually do that here. And I'll, I'll give a quick example of, uh, of uh, a simple package and a little more complicated one. So hoping some of you guys are familiar with Redis. It's an open source, uh, I guess, uh, data structure key-value system, as uh, uh, Salvatore mentioned, describes it. But, um, it basically is very, very simple. So on the left-hand side is, again, one of our conventions of basically using a really simple uh, YAML specification. Uh, it's basically a single blob pointing to a file, uh, the red star ball. And on the right-hand side, we have a packaging script that gets executed in the VM template where it's going to be uh, uh, run later on. So it literally does uh, make and a make install into a predefined uh, location. And um, right here, it, it's really important. So everything that goes into the Bosch install target, again, one of our conventions is what gets packaged up later on and will be deployed in all the VMs where it's going to be uh, consumed. This is important because the allocation is actually going to be the same location where we install it. So if you have any kind of hard coded limits in terms of like the shared library has to be in that location, like that's it's just going to work. So we manage all those things uh, for you. Everything that's not in there is not going to be saved and it's not going to be provided in the environment when it runs. So that's going to work. And then just a little bit more uh, of a complicated example. <coughs> so Warden is actually Cloud Foundry's um, uh, Linux C group um, manager, so similar to LXC for those of you who are familiar with that. Um, so the difference here is in the specification we have a dependency on Ruby. So when we actually uh, compile this, we need Ruby to run uh, the bundle exec uh, rake setup script. So that's what the dependency means. It means basically when you run this script, Ruby is going to be available on the system at that point in time. Uh, also has a couple of blobs, so one for uh, the warden and also one for the <coughs> gems which is executed in the prepackaging script because we actually don't want to check in the gems into our git tree. Again, we don't want to pollute our things. So uh, moving on to jobs. So jobs, like I said earlier, they kind of describe how the components are run inside of these gits. So we have a bunch of now you know, packages. We might have the Redis binary somewhere. We have the, you know, the warning uh, binary. But we need to actually describe to the VM how to actually go and uh, run this thing. And this is where I think things like Puppet and Chef actually shine much better than what we did. So again, we want to extend our system here. But uh, today, we basically have, again, a spec of describing what's inside of the, um, what's inside of the job, so which packages it needs. It has a list of templates. So again, if you're familiar with Puppet and Chef, uh, it's really similar to that. Um, we also have control scripts. So if you want to actually start it up and have some custom initialization code that goes in there. Uh, they're version exactly like the packages, so again, auto incremented build numbers, not really semantic versions. Um, and the two main things are supervision and monitoring. So we have uh, today a convention of using Monet uh, for supervision. We don't really have, we, we do have a strong dependency on that today, but it could be abstracted out for some reason. You guys don't like Monet. Um, but it does give us an easy way of actually querying whether the process or processes that we're running are healthy, and also whether. Um, uh, and we know exactly how to stop them and how to start them. So it's very important. If we, we have those verbs, we can do almost any kind of update. And the last part of the lifecycle hooks is, I kind of touched on it earlier, but if we want to do uh, updates where the interruption on the service is very limited, we need to be able to uh, provide some kind of notifications to these systems to tell them that, hey, by the way, you're about to be uh, shut down in 30 seconds. Try to at least stop accepting new connections, uh, finish your existing pending connections, and then after that, shut down basically. So this gives us uh, at least a way to do rolling updates with literally zero downtime on the system. At least for some components, again, that support this kind of uh, update, uh, update hook. So I'm going to go into, uh, again, a quick sample. I know the font's kind of small, but um, so this is uh, the VCAP Redis. So we have a Redis component in a Cloud Foundry distribution. Um, it has two templates. One is a control script. The second is the Redis configuration file. And in the package section, it has uh, two uh, packages that it needs. One is a common package, which has a bunch of common shell utilities that we use uh, in the system. 
And the second is the Redis package that we uh, saw earlier. Uh, the sample job, so basically this is a modest stanza for those of you familiar with Monet, but it's really simple. So at the very top we have uh, basically a location to the pit file and uh, start stop script and then finally the group vcap. Uh, our contract with Monet is that we basically assume that everything in the vcap group uh, is part of the deployment. So if you have four processes in here, we'll actually go and start and stop four processes whenever you do these deployments. The one interesting thing is if you look at the path, it has var vcap jobs and adds vcap regs. It's actually a similar, very similar to Capuchano uh, with how they do deployments there. Uh, that's important because, again, you might have um, hard coded paths to var vcap sys or var vcap jobs, vcap redis bin, but that's actually a similar to something else. So you don't have to worry about what version of the job or package you're using. It's actually resolved through a similar right here. So again, it's another convention and a contract that we use, but it makes a lot of things very easy later on, so you don't have to worry about what version you're on or whatnot. So here's a sample control script, again, it's probably even harder to see, but uh, the important thing here is it's actually a ERB template, and again, the templating engine was kind of a arbitrary choice for us, but it was just one that we chose at the time, and it allows us to basically pass in properties all the way from the deployment into the various configura uh, into these uh, configuration files. So uh, moving on to uh, releases, they kind of combine um, everything we just talked about. So it's basically a bundle of packages and jobs. It's just one large tarball. And there's a manifest that describes the shell ones, the versions, and uh, everything else that's basically composing this release. Uh, it, the release is completely self-contained. So if I take the large tarball um, for Cloud Foundry, it's roughly 700 megabytes today, and I give it to any one of you guys, um, you can go and deploy it on a, on a brand new, fresh cloud. Like then it doesn't have to be anything there. All the components are completely there. However, if for myself, I already have a deployed uh, cloud out there, deployed uh, Cloud Foundry instance. I can actually just make a change to a single file, build a new release, and upload it, and it's actually going to be smart enough to understand what their incremental change was. So you don't have to worry about you know, sending large and large payloads over and over again, it just, it just works. Uh, the last part is um, we have a concept of published and private releases. So when I, you know, my laptop, I'm packing on the next you know, version of you know, whatever the component is, and uh, I'm still not happy with it, I keep, I keep building iterations of these releases, but they're private releases. When, once I'm happy with what I just did, I actually build a, or a published release, which goes out into the, the shared blob store, and then all of the developers get a share of the work that I just did. So that's very important in a way to actually share things so everyone doesn't have to reproduce and actually uh, repeat everyone else's uh, work. Um, and then on the very bottom, you can see some of the CLI commands. So one of the things I mentioned was we really wanted to build a single tool for doing everything from release engineering all the way down to the very complicated updates. And if you can see, the four commands here are bosh, create release, upload release, delete release, and just to iterate the releases. And that's kind of important to us because, again, we have a lot of engineers working on this, and every single one of them is expected to be able to do this. So ease of use was really important to us. Uh, moving on to stem cells. So stem cells is just what we call our VM templates. Uh, they're very simple. Um, inside the VM template, the only real thing in there is the bosh agent. It's a little tiny Ruby agent that does all of the interesting things, like formatting the disks, mounting uh, various things, configuring the network, also downloading the packages, the jobs that we talked about, configuring your monitor, all of the things that actually you know, are necessary to get the system up and running. Um, it's versioned, again, similar to the things we mentioned before, so a single director or a single Bosch instance can have multiple stem cells. Uh, these stem cells, again, our only real contract is that there's an agent running inside. So, Today we build them using uh, Ubuntu or Debian's uh, VM builder, when in reality nothing is stopping this from being a Windows VM as long as it follows a similar contract. So we haven't really invested in SBs today, but again, there's nothing technical that's preventing that from happening. Um, and then finally, the, inside the agent, there's a tiny plugin for infrastructure. So for vSphere, I mean, there's very little bootstrapping that we have to do. So when we try to understand which actual SCSI disk to mount, we need to know what we're going to be using it for. And there's multiple disks, some for thermal storage, for some for persistent storage. So it's important to have that little plugin that tells you what to do. Also, it configures networking in environments that don't have a, a DHCP server. So again, it's kind of a, uh, it solves the chicken egg problem. Uh, for uh, vSphere, it's a little more, um, I guess, extensive because again, we have a lot of uh, things that we have explicitly configured. For AWS implementation we have out there, it just consumes the DHCP service provider already in there. And it also just knows about the thermal storage again that's provided uh, there as well. So for OpenStack, I think it's going to be really similar to the, to the uh, AWS implementation. 